On July 3, 1979, the CIA gave birth to Islamic fundamentalism when President Carter signed a directive for United States intelligence to provide radical Islamic thinking and arms to Afghan fighters before the Soviet Union invaded. This is documented in a 1998 interview with Zbigniew Brzezinski, Carter's national security advisor. Who killed John O'Neill? Who killed John, John O'Neill? Who killed John O'Neill? Council on Foreign, Foreign Relations, Relations Trilateral Commission, Commission, Bilderberg Group, the CIA, Bush family, Kissinger, CIA, Brzezinski, everybody. Everybody's there. Why don't more people know about it? Figure out the puzzle. Why don't they care? The Council on Foreign Relations has controlled out. the world for 50 figure years. Figure it out. You can go on their website and read about it. Everyone else. Flag I was a flag waving patriot. I thought Al Qaeda did it too. I thought we should bomb the Arabs straight back to the fucking Stone Age just like everybody else. Bomb them straight to hell. Then I read about John O'Neill. Maverick counterterrorism expert in the FBI. O'Neill tracked Osama bin Laden since 1995. Osama bin Laden. He knew more about Osama than anyone in the world. Tracked him past the embassy bombings in 98, coal bombing in 2000. He knew more about Osama and Al-Qaeda than anyone in the world. Isn't that interesting? And O'Neill? And O'Neill, he got into some trouble. His investigations into terrorism were blocked from up on high. Blocked by whom? In the summer of 2001, he resigned as deputy director of the FBI. At the same time, he was publicly opposed to the anti-terrorism policies of President George W. Bush. On September, September 10th, 10th 2001, September 10th, he started his new job with a company called Pearl Associates as head of security at the World Trade Center. A day later, he was dead. A victim of the September 11 he terrorist died at attacks. The World Trade Center. Come on! Come on! The FBI's top counterterrorism expert, who after chasing Bin Laden for six years, just happened to take a job in the private sector. He's murdered in an internationally televised terrorist attack, blamed on his arch nemesis. Killed by his arch nemesis. How ironic. Coincidence? Fate? Conspiracy. Conspiracy. Why did O'Neill start working at the World Trade Center? Why were his investigations into Al Qaeda stopped? Who arranged for him to get his new ill fated job? I know the answers to these questions now. None of them have anything to do with Osama bin Laden. The more you look at the whole and not just the pieces, you don't know anything. The more you understand what really happened. John O'Neill is the key. Look into John O'Neill. Cole Associate, Brian Jenkins, Jerome Howard. Look for John O'Neill, he's the key. Michael Cherkasky, you ever look into the LAPD? Why don't you go back to the end? Robert right. Mueller. John on the U.S. Attorney's Office. See what he has to say about the Bureau of Investigation. Go back and look at Robert Mueller. Mueller. Go back and look at CIA. Cassidy. Brett. The John Miller. ABC World Trade Journal. Center Building Number 7. Guess what they found out that Osama wanted to World Trade Center Building Number 7. Seven. You want to know where that came from? 23, 126. John Miller. It was a federal great friend of guess who? Of all the federal agents. John O'Neill. Great friends of guess who? Jerome Howard. Brian Jenkins. Jerome Howard. William Bratt. Jerome Howard. Everybody have a guy who got John O'Neill his job at the World Trade Center. You'll know everything. Let's begin. Now, for all intents and purposes, terrorism in this country officially began with the Pan Am 103 crash in 1988. Now, during this time, there have been minor terrorist acts. Small bombings, kidnappings, but not the big stuff, okay? So today, we're only going to discuss when the mother load arrived on our soil. On February 26, 1993, a bomb went off in the World Trade Center. Six people were killed and thousands were injured. The idea was to knock the North Tower into the South Tower so both would fall onto Wall Street. But that date is important. Do you know what that date signifies? It's the second anniversary of the end of the Gulf War. And who was blamed for that attack? Muslim extremists. Ramzi Youssef, Muslim extremist. Former Mujahideen fighter Ramzi Youssef entered the country on an Iraqi passport. Now he was sentenced to death by Manhattan Federal Court on September 11th, 1996. Are we beginning to see a pattern here? These Arabs sure have an affinity for anniversaries. Someone sure does. Now, what is their obsession with the World Trade Center? 
Well, you remember that we were all told that the World Trade Center was a target for terrorism because of one reason. It was the home base of the U.S. economy. But then we're told at the same time that the terrorists targeted us because of our values, because of our freedoms. So why bomb the World Trade Center when structures like the Statue of Liberty or the Washington Monument are far brighter beacons of freedom? Why indeed? I warned that the first World Trade Center attack was a staged event, a psyop, its sole purpose being to shine a light on the World Trade Center towers, to convince people that they were future targets of terrorism. I do recall all of the counterterrorism pundits after 9-11 saying, quote, Al-Qaeda always wanted to finish the job. Oh, I'll get to the counterterrorists in a little bit, but your point is well taken. But wait, wait, how do we know that the 93 bombing wasn't Al-Qaeda, hmm? Like everything, we don't exactly know, but in hindsight, it makes the most sense. And here's why. After 93, a series of terrorist attacks plagued the U.S. As we move through this, you will begin to understand how specific agendas within specific parts of government, media, and industry have created a propaganda campaign to wage war. With 9-11 as the prime selling point, there was the OKC bombing in 95, the embassy bombings in Africa in 1998, the USS Cole in 2000 in Yemen, and then, of course, there was 9-11. There was an anomaly in there. All the attacks you just mentioned were blamed on Al-Qaeda, except for OKC. However, there is a connection. Timothy McVeigh's lawyer claims that he and Terry Nichols were not the only two people who planned the OKC bombing. He contends that Nichols made several trips to the Philippines in the years before the bombings and met with Ramsey Youssef. McVeigh served in the Gulf War, and Youssef entered the country with an Iraqi passport. Coincidence? CONSPIRACY! McVeigh and Nichols both visited Al-Qaeda training camps in the Philippines after the Gulf War. Now at McVeigh's trial, significant evidence came out that either Al-Qaeda, Iraqi intelligence, or both assisted in the OKC bombings. And more importantly, hundreds of thousands of documents were withheld by the FBI from McVeigh's attorneys. The director of the FBI at that time was Louis Free. Now, no one knows what these documents contain, but they very well could have had evidence that McVeigh, Nichols, and other conspirators planned the OKC bombing. See, that doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't the government want to blame Al-Qaeda for OKC? Because it wasn't 9-11. Neither was the first World Trade Center bombing. You, you have to realize that, that the planning for 9-11 was, was years in advance, maybe even decades. All the terrorist activity leading up to it, they're, they're just little side notes. Little warnings of what was to come. So OKC is part of a larger plan. Exactly. All part of the same PSYOP. What's a PSYOP? A PSYOP is a clandestine intelligence operation. Okay, they, they, they are used to, to shift people's perceptions to, to, to a predefined agenda. PSYOPs are used in conjunction with more overt actions called military ops. So PSYOPs are conducted by taking an already established belief and then creating something false around that to take advantage of it. So you can see how easily a PSYOP could have been created surrounding 9-11. You begin by teaching Muslims a new version of Islam, full of violence and extremist beliefs. This sets up one part of the PSYOP, the Patsies. Then, over the years, you slowly mold the Patsies into a fully functioning military operation Guns, bombs, tanks, the works. Now, the Patsies hate you, but they have no idea that you are the one supporting them because you use an intermediary, someone they believe is on their side. And at the same time, well, you have your thumb on the Patsies, right? You filter out information to the public that the Patsies are the ones planning the attacks. So when the attacks happen, it is so easy to convince the public the Patsies are at fault. But on the flip side, the Patsies are doing nothing but talking tough and just committing smaller, less devastating attacks, while you yourself conduct the military op and carry out the more destructive major strikes. So with carefully executed planning and initiatives in place to keep it all secret, you have all the makings for a military intelligence psyop on 9-11. And OKC fits in how? Al-Qaeda is not the only enemy in this war on terror. Ever since this country's inception, a much larger, deeper, darker threat has existed against the powers that be. Dissent. 
Oklahoma City, it, it shone a light on, on militia groups and cults that were bent on dismantling the U.S. government, typically through military action. You know, it convinced the public that anyone who wanted to take down the U.S. government was as crazy as Timothy McVeigh. Or Kaczynski. The media rarely offers a favorable view of dissent. Only the people who want to destroy the world are ever covered. So just like the WTO convention, the protests in Seattle in 99, OKC discredited any movement questioning the federal government. Anyone questioning the real motives behind 9-11 would automatically be grouped in with people like McVeigh and Nichols, just by association and without even saying a word. So OKC was blamed on domestic terrorists as a means of stomping down dissent in this country. All in preparation for 9-11. So who was running the PSYOP? Have you ever heard of a company called Kroll Associates? The name sounds familiar. Oh, I guarantee you have seen Kroll on television. They are champions of counterterrorism. This is where the counterterrorists come in? Maybe they didn't run the PSYOP, but they sure as hell did cover it up. My friend, Kroll is bigger than you could possibly imagine. Kroll Associates is a global securities and intelligence firm. Publicly traded and privately managed, Kroll specializes in large building security and industrial espionage. In 1993, Kroll got a contract to manage security at the World Trade Center. They held that position up until the moment the towers fell. The current CEO of Kroll is Michael Tricaski. Tricaski is a former assistant district attorney under Robert Morgenthau in Manhattan. The former employees of Kroll include people like William Bratton, a former police commissioner in Boston and New York City, and now chief of the LAPD. And then, of course, there's Brian Jenkins. Based out of Los Angeles, Jenkins is the country's foremost expert on aviation terrorism. Now working for the powerful think tank, the Rand Corporation, out of Los Angeles, Jenkins is a noted counterterrorism pundit and appears on many talk shows and news magazines. And lest we forget, Jerome Hauer. Jerome Hauer, the go-to guy for bioterrorism. In an investigation of 9-11, Hauer's name comes up more than anybody else's. As a managing director of Kroll in New York City, Howard was responsible for doing security at the World Trade Center. Jerome Howard, Jerome Howard is also the guy that got John O'Neill his job as head security at the World Trade Center. Yes, he did. Just prior to this, Jerome Howard was Rudy Giuliani's right-hand man in New York, where he headed up the Office of Emergency Management, OEM, FEMA, in New York City. That was by Jerome Howard's suggestion that Mayor Giuliani constructed what became known as the Federal Bunker Offices in World Trade Center Building Number 7. Fireproof, bombproof, bulletproof, these OEM offices were basically Giuliani's headquarters in New York City. Until WTC 7 collapsed on 9-11. That is incredible. Besides just these jobs, Howard has been the number one bioterrorism expert in the whole world. He is a well-known advisor to the Council on Foreign Relations, formerly worked for the National Institute of Health, and is currently the head of the Office of Public Health Preparedness. And on the morning of 9-11, just as the attacks were happening, Howard instructed the entire White House staff to go on Cipro, the anti-anthrax drug. Now how did he know anthrax was going to become an issue? Well, as fate would have it, Howard worked in 1999 with Stephen Hatfield, the prime suspect in the anthrax attacks at the Scientific Applications International Corporation, the SAIC. This company, the SAIC, was awarded a huge biodefense contract after 9-11. Hatfield, a well-known friend of Jerome Howard, was working on the military-grade anthrax program at U.S. Amrid, Fort Detrick, Maryland. And Battelle. Don't forget Battelle, a chemicals company with long-standing ties to the CIA. Howard was well aware of the U.S. Amrit project in Maryland. 
So is Howard CIA? Trump the CIA! Come on! We don't know that. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. I mean, their intelligence is not just going to come right out and say it. But you know what they do. You know what they do. Oh, you know it. They are private intelligence! A managing director there has said, quote, Kroll is like a private CIA. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going on. And there are other companies like Kroll as well. There's TNR Protection, run by Robert Tucker. And Tucker! Tucker met with O'Neill and Howard the night before 9-11! They had drinks at Elaine's. There's Strang Hayes Consulting. There's Wagonhut Corporation. Then there's CTC International. The Cohen Group. And then there's Stratistic, formerly called Securicom. Stratistic also had a contract to do security at the World Trade Center. Securicom also had security contracts with Dulles International Airport and United Airlines. And remember, United had two planes crash on 9-11. And one of those planes came from Dulles. Now, an interesting note about Securicom is that from 1993 to 2000, one of its principal shareholders was a man by the name of... Marvin, Marvin Bush. Bush! Marvin Bush. Marvin Bush. Marvin Bush. The president's younger brother. That's an interesting connection. necessarily indicative of anything. It's six degrees of separation. Bush and Jumper brother doing security in the World Trade Center, something that needs to be seriously investigated! By that rationale, we could have known a guy who knew a guy who worked with a guy who stood in the same street corner as Jerome Howard, and therefore we're guilty. We are saying it's guilt by association. Which may be... We shouldn't do. You can't discount Kroll's connection to all of this! No, I can't. And I won't. Now, Kroll has been involved in a host of shady operations. In 1991, the Kuwaiti government hired Kroll to investigate Saddam Hussein's finances. In 2002, Kroll was given the massive responsibility of reorganizing Enron. Through 97 and 98, Kroll oversaw the elections of the Teamsters Union. And just following 9-11, Kroll was tapped by the LAPD to monitor all counterterrorism efforts in Los Angeles. Kroll really gets around. Kroll is tied to the FBI as well. The director of the FBI during Waco and the first World Trade Center bombing was a man by the name of William Sessions. Now, when he left the Bureau, he became a shareholder of Kroll. And the next FBI director was Louis Free. And Louis Free's top advisor at the Bureau was a guy named James Bucknam. Guess where he works now? He's a managing director of Kroll. Free is now a senior vice president at the MBNA Credit Card Corporation. His specific duties include personnel and security. Next to Enron, MBNA was the largest campaign contributor to George W. Bush in 2000. One of Free's deputy directors was James K. Carlstrom. Okay. At the time of 9-11, Kallstrom was head of New York State's Office of Public Security. And he also works at MBNA with Louis Free. And both Free and Kallstrom are well-known friends of Jerome Howard. Now it has been rumored that MBNA was one of the companies heavily involved in pre-9-11 insider trading, which would have been investigated by the SEC in New York City but all those records went down in World Trade Center 7. You want to know what really gets me? I'll tell you what really gets me. How all these, all these guys, how, how did Tchaikovsky and Jenkins and Bratton and Howard, just how the hell did they become terrorism pundits, huh? Huh? I mean, they, they, they draw themselves out on TV all the goddamn time and say, Al Qaeda this, and terrorist threat that, and from our research, and blah, 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 blah. Just where the hell did they get all their information? I hate to say it. But he's right. The unofficial law enforcement or intelligence, yet somehow they became the foremost experts on counterterrorism. 
A lot of them are former law enforcement. But terrorism is one of the most closely guarded fields of all intelligence. Why would you leak information just to a couple of buddies and allow them to trump all that information on a national television, hmm? To build up the propaganda campaign, obviously. To frame up Al-Qaeda before and after the fact. Look, we've all got to understand then that a company like Kroll, even though it won't disclose its intelligence ties, is, is intimately linked to the CIA. But if we're saying that the CIA runs domestic terrorism operations. We are saying Kroll does as well. These people have so much information about terrorism because they're either deeply rooted to intelligence or they are intelligence, privatized, in order to make their work legal and untouchable by Congress. Oh God, oh God, are we? Are we saying that, that, that the people who run counterterrorism may very well be the terrorists themselves. Look, it's no coincidence that Kroll did security at those buildings. And it's no secret that Kroll employees have more inside knowledge about terrorism than even the FBI and the CIA do. They are inexplicably in a position to get inside information, even from people like John O'Neill. Then they come out and they warn the country, or they tell everybody what the, how, how the whole terrorist outfit works. They are well-placed operatives working a specific agenda to frame the patsies. And what do they say? To frame someone, you have to know the real details of the crime? Kroll is our suspect number one. No one had more means, motive, or opportunity to commit this attack. You can't be serious. What you're saying the suicide. You do not go out and publicly accuse a company like Kroll Associates of being a publicly traded terrorism company, okay? These people profit from insider knowledge of coming terrorist attacks. They don't disclose their credentials or their contacts. They merely claim they are experts from Kroll, and that's supposed to mean they are trustworthy. We need to stick to what we can prove here. All of this is just blatant speculation and can discredit this entire thing. Unless it's true. This is not how you run an investigation. You do not just dream up a hypothesis and then change the evidence to make it come true. You follow your leads. Which led to crawl! But not to this wild theory. I'm sure that these counter-terrorists are involved somehow. But there is no proof whatsoever that they took part in any of the attacks or even had any foreknowledge. So does that mean we just forget about it? Move on to the next topic? No. It means we don't get sidetracked. We can't just go flapping our lips about any old theory that we want to. So then how does Cole get their information? How do these guys, of all people, know information that, that, that even our paid law enforcement and intelligence officials don't know? I mean, how does one become a terrorism expert anyway? You already have your answer. Former FBI directors on their board, former bio-warfare experts within their infrastructure, members of major think tanks as directors, former U.S. attorneys as executives. This company is filled with people who could have had prior knowledge and just kept their contacts secret. This is a security company, after all. And one of the most important security issues facing the world in the last 20 years has been security from terrorism. That's where they get all their information. That is how they become counterterrorism experts. He has a point. There is clearly something wrong with Kroll, but we can't jump to conclusions. So then where do you think Kroll fits into this whole thing? They're just a group of for-hire thugs. They come in and trump up the charges on whoever needs to be guilty, and then they fade back into the shadows. The only thing I see them being guilty of is misleading the public. And the purpose of that? Maybe you're right. Maybe it is to cover up their crime. Or maybe, and so that people will hire them to secure their buildings. 
Maybe they take advantage of 9-11 the same way that Bush does. They take advantage of 9-11 for profit. Come on, Cherkasky is the CEO. It's obvious he's dirty. Obvious to us, yes. Look, Cherkasky takes us back to New York. Let's focus on that. How much do you know about the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Manhattan? Not that much, although I'm sure they've been involved with the most high-profile cases in this country's history. Right, and it's time we went through that history. Louis Free spent his entire career in law enforcement in New York City before becoming FBI Director. And from 1981 to 1991, Free worked as a U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York City. And Rudy Giuliani worked in that same office from 1983 to 1993, just before he became mayor. And do not forget, don't you dare forget, that Cherkasky, the, 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 the current CEO of Kroll, okay, the Kroll guy, he was in New York too at the same time. He was doing all the prosecutions too. You know it. Make sure you tell him. But Noriega, Gotti, and the BCCI have one very special thing in common. What's that? They were all key players in the global drug trade. I figured drugs would make their way into this story. Make their way? My friend, drugs are at its core. What do you know about the global drug trade? Only what I read in the papers. Then you know nothing. This is covered with even less honesty in the mainstream press than 9-11 is. I've always assumed intelligence was involved. As usual, your assumption would be correct. The war between the Soviets and the Afghans ended in 1979. Meanwhile, the drug trade from Latin America was heating up with significant assistance from the CIA. It started big time with the formation of the Median Drug Cartel in Colombia in 1978. Founded by Carlos Leader, the Choke Brothers, and Pablo Escobar, the Median Cartel operated by manufacturing the coca plant into cocaine and shipping it to the U.S. The collaboration began when Leader purchased an island in the Bahamas. Where corporate tax and banking laws are extremely lenient. And used that land as a jumping off point to launder the money taken in by the drug sales. The Bahamas is home to thousands of tax-exempt corporations, including companies owned and managed by American International Group, AIG, the largest insurance company in the world and the sixth largest corporation in the world. One of AIG's companies in the Bahamas is named after a woman called Coral Talavera. And who is she? She's Carlos Leader's wife. She is the head of an AIG branch in San Francisco. I don't understand. Isn't Carlos Leader in prison? Not anymore. Carlos Leader was extradited from Colombia to the United States for trial in 1987. A year later, he was convicted and sentenced to life plus 135 years for drug trafficking and murder. While he was in prison, Carlos Leader struck a deal with the United States. Take down the cartel and he would be granted freedom. Along the way, he implicated and then testified against Manuel Noriega. Panamanian dictator and middleman for the Medellin cartel. Noriega was captured through an invasion of Panama in 1989 under the first President Bush. He was convicted of drug running, racketeering, and money laundering in 1992. And leader? According to the official U.S. record, whereabouts unknown. See, there's one thing that ties all these points together. The cartel, AIG, the CIA, the Contras, Noriega, one thing connects them all. The BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, or for our discussion today, the granddaddy of all money laundering scams, 